crashes over me, crashes over me, feel a floor, you are my guest, champion of death. Oh, good morning, guys. Great job. Lauren, Clint, Bravo. screaming kids in the background. <laughs> so if, uh, if you didn't hear me already just a little bit ago, I am coming to you live in Harrisburg with Danielle and Derek. And <laughs> We're going to have some screaming kids in the background. We <laughs> have some kids here with us and in the background. But Danielle and Derek are doing some great stuff here in Harrisburg, creating community here in their neighborhood and always coming up with ideas to serve people, raise support to help people in need, which is super great. So we'd love to start with just a time of communion to remember Jesus's perfection in our place. So if you have something, great. If you don't, go get it. I'll give you 18 seconds. You can do it. 
We also have barking dogs. We let the dogs in. <laughs> okay. We have um, monkey bread. Monkey bread. Yes. And coffee. Oh, so, um, hey, good morning, guys. Okay, okay. Safety easy outside. Good morning. Do more. Hop on with us here. Good. Okay. Let me. Hold on. If you're not muted, mute yourself. Good to go here. Yep. Sweet. Okay. So take whatever you have. Monkey bread, bacon, casserole, leftover burger from your 4th of July gathering, whatever it is. Thank you, Jesus, for being perfect in our place and for declaring us perfect, holy, innocent, righteous, because on our own, we had no chance of that, that's for sure. We thank you that, you're, that you are life, that, that you're the bread of life, that your body was broken for us. You said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And um, if you don't eat my flesh, you have no part in me. So we just thank you for, for, for being life for us. We thank you for- Eating is 876. Oh, we got, we got somebody, somebody not muted. There we go. Cool. So thank you for, for being perfection in our place and for declaring us holy, innocent, and perfect. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And that, guys, that's breakfast, lunch, dinner. That's all day, all night, every day. Jesus in our place perfection in our place, righteousness in our place. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. That's good. I think I want to take a lot of communion this morning. <laughs> and Jesus also said, this is my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Every time, every time that we take the cup, we remember Jesus. So thank you, Jesus, for pouring out your blood for us, for covering all of our sin and imperfection. We love you. Amen. Okay, now um, we are going to get into the story of Noah. If you didn't, if you didn't catch that with 40 days and 40 nights as being the theme, um, we're going to get into Noah here and we're going to start off with Danielle reading. We're going to go back and forth for a little reading here. If I read the entire story, the entire Noah story, we'd be going three chapters. So we cut out some snippets of it and we're going to weave it all together. Okay, here we go. All right, so we're starting with Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 14. The Lord, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens for i am sorry that i have made them but noah found favor in the eyes of the lord noah and the flood these are the generations of noah noah was a righteous man blameless in his generation noah walked with god and noah had three sons shem ham and Go ahead and say that. Go with Japheth. <laughs> Japheth. <laughs> now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and for all flesh had corrupted their way on earth. 
And God said to Noah, I have det determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is Genesis chapter seven, verses four to five. For in seven days, I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. And every living thing that I have made will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Genesis 7, 12 to 23 says, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, <laughs> and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kinds and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature, they went into the ark with Noah. Two of two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those who entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beast, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the earth. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And I, whenever I read this, I think I can't for the life of me understand why um, moms and dads decorate their kids' nurseries <laughs> with the flood. It was like the most horrific event of death and casualty in the history of <laughs> humanity. Anyway, um, moving on. Uh, on to Genesis. Oh. There we go. Yeah, right here. yeah, Genesis chapter eight, verse one. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. Genesis chapter 8, verses 6 to 17. At the end of the 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had, had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him uh, to the ark for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put his hand out and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and set forth the dove, and she did not return to him any more. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from the earth. And Noah rem removed the covering of the ark and look, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swim on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. I love the connection of the dove. I don't, 
Um, I don't know if you remember last week when we talked about all the connections in the creation story to the larger themes all through scripture that lead us to Jesus. But this picture of the dove and hovering over the waters, and then you get Jesus who comes up out of the water and the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. And just this beautiful picture that ultimately finds its fulfillment in Jesus constantly. Okay. Not absolutely. Um, here we go. We'll read the next section here. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. When the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Genesis 9, 12 to 13, and God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And God saying, I'm never going to do that whole flood business again. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 to 27. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Did I say that? Good enough. Japheth? I don't Japheth. know. Japheth. Sometimes I just say Big J or something. If I can't pronounce a name. We'll go with Big J. Big J. Shim Ham and Big J, as they, as they knew him back then. In 2020, yep. Ham was the father of, now I get all the names I can't read. Canaan. Canaan. I also have like, like eight font, so sorry about that. That's okay. These are the sons of Noah, and from these people of the whole earth, whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham and the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem, Shem and Big J <laughs> took a garment and laid it on both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backwards, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Curse be Canaan. A servant of the servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Big J and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. It's mm. good. I um. I think you, none of these stories make any sense to me whatsoever without, without Jesus. And when you understand the Jesus story and you go back and read these stories, then you go, oh, no, I, I know that. I'm familiar with that. And so the first thing in this that, that really jumps out at me is the 40 days and 40 nights. The 40 days and 40 nights that rain fell on the face of the earth. And then you, you move forward to the story of David and Goliath, and Goliath taunts Israel for 40 days. Then you move forward to Moses, who goes up to get the Ten Commandments, and he climbs up on the mountain. He's on the, he's on the mountain for 40 days. So then when Jesus, when you see Jesus going out to start his ministry, and he goes out into the wilderness, and he's tempted by Satan for 40 days. And you go, oh, no, I know, I know 40 days. I know 40 days. There's this time of trial or difficulty or attack of the enemy. And it ultimately finds its fulfillment in Jesus. And it's fascinating to me. When you see some of these numbers or stories, they pop up and you just go, I, I can see how this, how this connects to Jesus. It, it was all meant to somehow... When, when you read it, when you read the number 40, you went, oh, no, 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 I know this. As a, as a Jew, you would go, I know the number 40. That reminds me of Noah. That reminds me of Moses. That reminds me of David. 
you hear that number immediately your ears perk up so then whenever you, you see jesus come onto the scene he starts his ministry and then you see jesus led by the holy spirit by the dove by the holy spirit into the wilderness for 40 days and you go oh i see what i see what god's doing here pretty fancy right you like it beautiful connections right you, you see Jesus in the whole thing. Um, but all through this story, I, I think it's, it's fascinating to me because of the incredible brokenness and sin and evil and that God looked upon the whole earth and he wanted to sort of like a, a Nintendo game. <laughs> he sort of wanted to hit the reset, but when I was a kid and I would fall behind, I would hit the reset, I would take the cartridge out and try to start all over again. Um, you see God looking at planet Earth going, man, this is an absolute disaster. This is a mess. These people are broken. It didn't surprise him. I mean, of course, God shows us before the foundation of the world. Um, he, he knew that we would be, be broken and sinful and imperfect and a mess. And somehow we have in our minds this idea that these followers of Jesus were really great, or followers of Jesus in the New Testament were really great people. Followers of God in the Old Testament, Noah and Moses and David and all these different figures that we have in mind, we think of them as being holy or good or they had their act together or they had halos above their head or they were more godly than us in, in some kind of way. But when you read the Old Testament, and when you read the New Testament, what do you see? A lot of broken people. <laughs> God picks the unexpected to um, be the the main characters of His story. He chooses them. You see a lot of you see a lot of mess, right? Yeah, yeah a lot of mess. I mean, I one of the things I've been doing is uh, reading reading the whole Bible in ninety day period. So four times a year, I'm cycling through all of the scripture. And what you end up doing is reading like 15 chapters at a time, um, 12 to 15 chapters at a time, chunks, chunks of the Bible. And something crazy, reading through the Old Testament in chunks, 15 chapter chunks, not just isolated stories or one chapter at a time, but if you read 15 chapter chunks, what you find yourself doing is going, oh my goodness, these people are really messed up. <laughs> you just start going through these stories and saying, man, every single story that I read here is a story of brokenness and sin and adultery and deceit and murder and cover up and there's just brokenness all over the body. And then you see rules and rules and rules and rules in the Old Testament just tons of rules. Uh, 613 laws, 10 commandments. If, if Jackie gives me a list of grocery stores, I never even like execute my grocery store list. I forget the 10 or 15 things that are on the grocery store list. I can't, even, I can't yeah, Jackie, Jackie's piping in back here. He can't even remember two things. I'm like, so you said water and what? Milk. Oh, okay. Good, good. Milk. Good. And so that's that's part of our that's part of our issue is we look through the Old Testament. Let's see. We got somebody. There we go. We just see a lot of uh, a lot of imperfection, a lot of sin, a lot of brokenness, a lot of failure, a lot of a lot of dead carcasses, a lot of animals, a lot of dead animals, a um, lot of sacrifices, a lot of burnt sacrifices, a lot of that kind of stuff. And somebody keeps unmuting themselves. There we go. And so I, I find myself in reading all of that, um, just feeling like when you look at the New Testament, and you see the verse in Galatians that said, all who desire to live um, under the law are under a curse. And it says, for it is written, whoever does not abide by every word 
written in this book is cursed, is under a curse. And you go, man, we, like, we have to be perfect. God, God demands perfection. Go and never sin again. And you just see constant brokenness. Yeah, I mean, I said to Mike when I was reading the story, like, gosh, I would not, I would have been on the earth that God wipes clean. Like, it's overwhelming and it's daunting to think about, you know, what happened in this story where Noah was the only person that was selected and his family, along with all the animals they put in the ark, to not be wiped clean. And it just makes me so thankful that Jesus came and covered all my sins because I am probably the furthest person from perfect that I can think of. And I've probably sinned a hundred times since I woke up this morning until right now. So I just think it's amazing to know that, you know, we have Jesus who covered all of our sins and the intricacies of these stories that you look at, you know, it, it's, it can be overwhelming and it can be daunting, but to also know that Noah also messed up. So it wasn't just that he was totally perfect all the time, but that I think he carried God in his heart and he loved him and he worked hard to be the person that God saw him to be. Well, there's a lot of sinning in one morning, Daniel. Times. <laughs> yeah. When um, the kids wake up at the same time as me, yeah. <laughs> Depending on the age of your children, how many times do you say? I'm throwing the babies on him to get him to wake up. That's, that's awesome. No, I, I uh, when when you look at Noah, you you never get the image of this drunk naked guy, right? No. But at the end of the at the end of the Ark story, the next story that you see. As he goes out, it's like this big reset on the brokenness of humanity. Okay, Noah, now you're going to go do it right. Mm -hmm. Un Actually, unlike the world that I just wiped out, you're going to yeah. go do it right. And then he gets so obliterated that he takes his clothes off and passes out naked, uh -huh. right? Yeah. So I, much for a restart. I think, as sitting here listening to this, it, it almost made me like equate it to like what our social media could be like today. Like... Noah and the ark, like I picture Noah like standing really big and brave, like in front of his ark with all of his animals, like that's his Instagram post or his like Facebook photo where he's just like, yeah, here I am with my ark, like I'm awesome. God picked me. And then, you know, like, hashtag chosen one. Yeah. And then later on, like he got all these likes and he got all the, the things and then he's like, yes, I'm awesome. Let's, you know, build. And then he ends up like getting wasted. That's yeah, the picture that just came into my mind. Yeah, look at me with the animals. Hashtag chosen one, <laughs> yeah. righteous boy. Him and his family got it all together. <laughs> look at my family. He's holding the dove, you know, and, and then he ends up kind of getting wasted. He, 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 <laughs> he ends up a mess, but yeah. but like but like the rest of us. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think you look around and go, we are broken. We are imperfect. You read these stories of these people that God uses throughout the, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the common theme that you see is imperfect, 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 imperfect. Broken, 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 broken. And there is no category of good and bad. The categories are perfect, imperfect. That's it. Those are the categories. And God despises improvement. He demands perfection. And what do we end up seeing? That we're broken and so are all of our friends. So you look at Noah and you go, oh no, I know that guy. He's in my neighborhood, right? You look at David, you go, oh yeah, I know that guy. You look at Saul, you go, oh yeah, I know that guy. So all the way across, all these different people in scripture, and including ourselves, we look at them and we see the people that are in our lives and we see ourselves in their story as broken, flawed, imperfect people in need of grace. And we, we can't somehow tame the stories and make it look like these people had their acts together and that the Bible is some sort of story where we need to get our act together and fly right. Really, it's a story of people that were called to be made in the image of, of the creator who were going out, multiplying, filling the earth with God's glory. But at every turn, they fail. At every turn, they're broken. At 
every, every turn they screw up repeatedly. And yet God continues to love them, bless them, redeem them, provide an ark, provide rescue, and ultimately, you know, be the hero in the story. So the, so the next part that you see in the, uh, the drunk and naked thing <laughs> is, and, and this is a big one, guys, this is huge, is that his sons see him, one of his sons sees him passed out, drunk and naked, and he sort of laughs at him and tells his brothers about it. Like, come, you gotta, like, dad is totally obliterated. Like, you should have seen him. We set off the fireworks. <laughs> Dad got so wasted. This might have happened in somebody's neighborhood <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> got so wasted. No story could be very real. <laughs> yeah, it's his own, his own uh, microbrews or whatever. He is just, he is out of it. And look at him. It, it's embarrassing. He's like passed out naked in the tent. And the, the crazy thing is the, the other brothers come in. They won't look at their dad. They walk in backwards and they cover him with a blanket. And I, I think that's an incredible lesson for us is what, what do we do when we see the brokenness and, and sins of other people? Do we cover their sins and their brokenness or do we expose them, call them out, make fun of them, um, you know, gossip about them? Do you know what so-and-so did? Do we embarrass other people or do we save their dignity? Do we cover their nakedness? Love covers a multitude of sins. Love overlooks an offense. Jesus came to, to cover our sin and our imperfection. And you see that in Adam and Eve, the story before this, when we're, when we're talking last week in the creation story, Adam and Eve's sin, what does God do with Adam and Eve? He covers them. He covers them. They try to cover themselves with fig leaves, but then God turns around, he kills an innocent animal, and then he clothes them in the skins of that animal, which is the same Hebrew word for garments of righteousness. Adam and Eve sin, God covers Adam and Eve in his righteousness. Noah sins, and his son who covers him is blessed and rewarded by God. The one who makes fun of him or calls him out is not. He's actually cursed, right? And then so you, you move forward and you get the sacrificial system and you, you've got the, the animals who cover our sin and our, and our brokenness. And then you get Jesus who covers our sin and our brokenness in himself. You even get language from Paul which says, put on Christ, like he's a, like he's a jacket, like he's a blanket, like put him over you. Like Jesus covers you. He covers your brokenness and your imperfection. Think about the prodigal son story. The prodigal son sins, and when he comes back, when he returns to the father, what does the father do? He covers him. He covers him. He puts a royal robe on him. He calls him royalty. Now you look at the very end for Christians, we are, we are given white robes and we're covered. All of us sinners are covered and the perfection and the robes of, of God. And in the same way that the prodigal is covered and Noah is covered and we are covered. It's beautiful, just beautiful, beautiful imagery. Rather than, than expose, embarrass, call out other people, what does it look like to preserve their dignity, cover them, love them, not embarrass them, cover their sin, their shame, their nakedness like Adam and Eve, like Noah, we cover the sin, the shame, the nakedness, and we restore them in love. This beautiful picture, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's important too when we talk about like covering somebody's sin or restoring their dignity or their faith, you do it expecting nothing in return. Noah's sons did it to cover him, ex not expecting to be blessed in return. And so I think it's important that we as Christians do the same thing, that if we're covering you know, somebody's sin or if we're speaking highly of somebody or doing it in, in for them, it's important to recognize that you're doing it for that person, to help that person, but not to expect something in return or expect praise or anything like that because knowing that you're doing it in the name of Jesus and for him because you're one of his followers um, should truly be enough. 
to yeah. cover your heart. It's remarkable to me that the anger of God at a son who, who um, draws attention to the brokenness of his father rather than covering him in love. Fascinating to me. And then I go, how many of us are known for talking about people who screw up rather than covering them and loving them and helping them experience redemption and cleaning up their reputation because we care for them? The same way that God covers us, restores us, gives us life and hope while we're broken and sin, while, while we're dead in our trespasses and sins, he makes us alive. He covers us makes us righteous again, redeems us, restores us. He takes us out of the gutter and polishes us off. It's just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful imagery. So um, the other theme that you see here is this post everything being destroyed and sort of a, a restart. They come off the ark and then it's go out again same message as Adam and Eve in the original creation account. Multiply, be fruitful, fill the earth. It's another theme that you see all over the Bible. Go, be fruitful, multiply, uh, fill the earth. And you get Noah. Again, the earth's destroyed by flood. Never going to do the flood business again. Now go, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And, and then later on, you see Tower of Babel, right? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. No, we're going to stay. Then you see Abraham, I'm, I'm going to make you as numerous as the stars in the sky, and you're going to be all over the earth. And so there's this multiplication thing that's spoken into creation. Then you see Jesus with his disciples. You're going to be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. There's this um, health and life is about multiplying, reproducing, filling the earth with good things communities of people. God's church is a living organism. We reproduce, we multiply, we fill the earth, we go, we're, we're fruitful, we're starting things, we're reaching people, we're seeing new things form, and yet we have this tendency to not go and multiply and reproduce and fill the earth. We do it personally. We like to stay within our own comfort zone. We like to stay where we're at, we like to stay with the same group of people. You saw that theme last week, but again, you get that theme of, of multiplication again. God speaking that into Noah. You see that Jesus in the, in the Gospels and Jesus with the disciples speaking that into them. Go out. I've sent you as the Father sent me. I send you now. Go, go. We're people that are sent to go multiply out. Um, but yet, there's I like this this tendency to not go. We're having muting issues today. Um, there's this tendency to not go. You've seen that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I've done it myself too, where, you know, you feel led to, to do something, called to do something, and you're like, oh, no, I don't think like that's really what you want me to do. But um, we're always called to, to add, make things, create things, whether it turns into an epic failure <laughs> or something that's really awesome. Um, you, you should always just try because what, what hurts, what's the hurt in trying? Yeah, there, there's such a, a fear that holds people back of what if I screw up? And if there's anything that I'm, I'm picking up in my constant reads all through scripture is that um, brokenness, sin, imperfection, failing is not an obstacle for God. For, for the God who redeems broken sinners and raises the dead and calls sinners to repentance and saves humanity. Like he uses the least, the last, the lost, the little, the dead. That's who God likes to work through. And so there's this uh, feeling of inadequacy. God can't use me. I can't go. I'm not good enough. But yet you read all of all of these people that God uses and you just see mess, like just incredible mess. Mm -hmm. And God chooses to work through broken people repeatedly. And even after he uses them, they royally screw up. <laughs> like God uses these people and it's not like I took you out of the mess 
you were righteous, I use you, and now you're this incredible light in the world. You get constant brokenness even after that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the, the point is, as, as you read all these laws in the Old Testament, you see the call of God for perfection and righteousness and goodness. You know that we're, we're broken and we don't fulfill it. Um, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And our big obstacle is not sin. We're all sinners. We all sin and fall short. That's not an obstacle. Jesus has paid our debt. He's covered our sin. He makes us righteous. He declares us innocent. Our big obstacle is pride. What keeps us from being used by God isn't sin. God uses sinners. Our biggest obstacle that keeps us from being used by God is our, is our pride, is right. our inability. Say, like, Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen! <laughs> it's our inability to like admit our brokenness, right? Like, yeah. God, I, I'm a big mess. I'm the chief of sinners, Paul said. I'm broken and imperfect. And God goes, that's who I use. God uses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. I think that God intentionally, um, all throughout the Old Testament, but then when Jesus shows up, he doesn't pick the religious scholars of the day. Jesus goes out and he picks the most unlikely characters to be his ambassadors. He picks fishermen and young boys to come and follow him. And you go, what? What is he picking these people for? And then he chooses someone like Paul, who was a persecutor of Christians to go out and write so much of the New Testament. And you go, why would God use, it, it seems like he went out of his way to pick broken people, which were all broken, but he wanted to make an example that our brokenness and sin is not, it does not keep us from being used by God. He, God actually use, uses broken sinners. Mm -hmm. it's, our, it's our pride, it's our inability to say, be merciful to me, a sinner. I don't think you so much have to be like a thinker, but more of a doer because God will provide the ideas and the knowledge and the thought that you need. It's just a matter of um, the follow through in it. So you don't have to, an idea pops in your head. You're like, okay, great God, let's do it. <laughs> and, and then you just follow the steps that could be laid out for you, or you reach out and you ask somebody. And I see that so often too in scripture where a lot of the people were doers. Um, and it's great if you're a thinker and a doer, I have a lot of respect for, for you if you're one of them like him. But um, I, I look at myself more as a doer, not so much a thinker. I can't think, um, you know, even last night I was saying to Derek, like, I'm really nervous to get on this call because I don't think I speak really eloquently or can maybe articulate all the thoughts that I have. I see myself more as somebody who likes to do things, more of an action person. So um, I think just knowing that you can just follow through with whatever ideas put in your head and it'll, the, the plan will be laid out for you and you can ask people for help. Yeah, there, it's amazing when, when Jesus calls his disciples, he says, come and follow me. They don't know where they're gonna go. No idea. Like, where are we going to go? And every day when they walk with Jesus, they had no clue where they were going to end up. Are we going to be on a boat? Are we going to be on a mountainside? Are we going to be hugging lepers? Or are we going to be at some random person's party house with prostitutes and tax collectors? Who knows? Every day was sort of this wild ride with Jesus. And I think the, the, um, the call to discipleship is just the willingness to say yes. I mean, as Joe said here in the chat, there will always be reasonable people with reasonable reasons who will challenge the audacious call of God. And I, that's so true. I mean, if you, if you take time to think, to think about it, you can think your way out of following Jesus every time. There's always a reason why right now in this season, at this time, I can't step out and follow God. I can't start something. I can't take action. I can't do it, maybe later, maybe another time. And I, I think a big key in it is like Danielle said, just developing the yes impulse, saying, yeah, I'll do it. I don't know how, <laughs> I'm sort of nervous. Um, I don't know how it's gonna turn out, but I'm willing to say yes to the call of God. And then we'll figure it out as we go. We'll figure it out as we go. So the, it, it is that willingness to step out, to go, to fill the earth with the glory of God, which is what God's people are called to. 
Um, the other theme that you see here is humanity is, is broken. It sort of goes back to uh, the, the creation account where you have the waters and then right after the waters you have dry ground, right? So God separates the waters, dry ground appears. Well, now you have the flood and then the waters separate and dry ground appears again. It's like a, the whole creation story all over again. And then you have sacrifice, the first thing you see. So you've, you've got the sinfulness of Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve sin and what happens? Innocent animals killed, sacrifice. Noah sins and all of humanity sins. And then you have Noah get off the ark. The first thing you see is sacrifice. And then you move forward to Abraham and Isaac and you get the image of sacrifice rather than the, the innocent son or the son dying instead of innocent animal dying. Then you get the Old Testament Passover lamb who's sacrificed for the sins of the people. Then you get Jesus, the lamb of God, sacrificed for humanity. So again, all throughout the story, you see these constant themes, Adam and Eve, sacrifice. Noah, sacrifices. All throughout the Old Testament, sacrifices for the people. Tons of animals, tons of sacrifices. But the constant image is there's imperfection, God demands perfection. You're either perfect or you're, you're in trouble. God does not uh, grade on the curve. You must be perfect. You must be sinless. You must be completely innocent. And yet you've got brokenness constantly. But then Jesus is perfect for us. And Jesus was sacrificed to replace our imperfection. And that's a theme, Adam and Eve, Noah, Isaac, Passover, all the way to Jesus. The whole thing is, is symbolically setting us up. In fact, if we read the Old Testament without thinking Jesus, you go, this seems really, I mean, this is actually hard to read. Mm -hmm. It's actually really hard to read. But then you read Jesus, you go, oh, I see. It was always, it was always setting us up. We were always being set up for the Jesus story. Jesus makes sense of this whole thing, this whole deal. Brilliant. Well, guys, it's good to see you on your videos, your watch parties, your gatherings. And it's good to have Danielle with me. <laughs> yeah, I think so she did a great job. I, I, she's a great teacher. So I wanted her voice in here with me. Um, but again, I, I think these, these themes are really good and important. The larger themes of 40 days, the larger themes of covering in the blanket, the larger theme of multiply and fill the earth, the larger theme of sacrifice and Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice. Do you see it? Do you see that this whole story, every, every bullet point that I just mentioned points us to Jesus? Do you see it? Because once you see it, I feel like you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. you, we have to start and then forever see all of the Bible through the lens of Jesus. It's not a bunch of separate stories and then Jesus is a surprise. It's the whole thing is Jesus. It's Jesus right in the middle of it. And he makes sense of the whole thing for us. So when we look out at our, at our broken neighborhood, we go, yeah, no, I know this story, but Jesus redeems the brokenness. Jesus uses them and us. We're all imperfect, but Jesus was perfect for us. And now we get to go out and create and be good news and expand and multiply and fill the earth with the glory of God. Thank you, Jesus. This is great news. Good? Mm -hmm. So go, create, impact, love others, and don't let sin be the obstacle. Continue to be humble and broken. When you see people screw up, what do you do, Daniel? I'm screwed up too. It's okay. Do you, do, you say, do you say, hey, look at him. He's all drunk and passed out. Or do you, do you cover the person's dignity? You should cover them. Yep. And, and let them know that they're not alone. So. Yeah. The same way that Jesus covered us with his, with his blood. He covered us with the royal robes. He declared us innocent. He took away our shame and our guilt. That's what Jesus does for us. We get to do that for, for the people that we love. It's such good news. 
Let me pray for each of us that we would, we would go out and declare not just our independence as a country, but that we are free people, that Jesus has set us free, right? It is for freedom that Jesus has set us free. He has set us free so that we would be free. So Jesus has declared us free and innocent. Beautiful. God, we thank you for your goodness, for the righteousness that you declared over us, that while, while we were sinners, you died for us. Um, we, we are just so thankful that you have covered us, that love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. So you, you walked backwards and covered a blanket right over top of us. You put the royal robe over us. You, you were the, uh, the perfect lamb that was slain and your skins have, have covered our, our unrighteousness with your righteousness and we were declared innocent. And there's just so much beauty in that. We are so thankful for your grace, which covers us, for your, uh, that, that we can put you on like a jacket that we put on, Christ, that we put you on. And we, we don't have a righteousness of our own, but a righteousness that comes through faith in you, that, that you were what we aren't, that you were perfect even though we're not, that we don't need to look at people in the categories of good and bad and um, look up to certain people and down on other people, but we look at all of humanity as broken and yet declared innocent in you, Jesus. And so we thank you for that. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you that we're citizens of your kingdom, that we're called, that we're sent. And I pray for courage in each person that is on this morning, that we would um, go out and multiply and be good news and create new things that rather than think about how unqualified we are that we would look at all these unqualified losers all throughout the bible that were used by you and declared winners even though they were losing and so we thank you for that that message of freedom we thank you for your calling of of people that are messed up like us so we humble ourselves before you and we love you. We'll talk to you later. Amen. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. Happy 4th of July weekend. Now you can unmute yourselves. We can say hi to each other. Great job, Danielle. Thank you. Have an awesome weekend, everyone. Thank you. You too. Good to see you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Bye, Linda. Bye, Russ. Russ. Hi. What's up, Russ, Linda? Hey. Tony, Lauren, Clint. Hey guys, Dale, Amy, Charlie, Judy, Ron, Brian, George. I see the Phillies hat. Nice, sweet. 